Thank you. So here is the three main elements of games. You can say three principles of games. So make belief, rules, and challenges are related to meaning. When I say meaning, how do we make experience and activity connected to the user in a meaningful fashion? And I will explain further in my later uh, PowerPoint, but make belief, rules, challenges, makes meanings. And also, if you set a goals and instant feedback with a reward, it's more related to mastery. You need to clear something, you need to learn from doing and clear again. So this is mastery. And finally, uh, not to uh, forget the autonomy, it's a, it's a sense of freedom. And uh, autonomy is something that you are willing to do. It's not like a work that you have to do. When you say autonomy, it's something that you are willing to do. And this is a very, very important driver as well. So, uh, principle of game, meaning. So how does video game achieve kind of meaning to the activity? This is another illustration taken from Mario Kart. So objective is to save a princess, Peach Princess. She was abducted by this uh, Koopa. And your goal is to save her. That's a simple goal. But there is a story here which you can devote your feeding into. Another illustration or example. This is a, a very old game uh, on a, an Atari game. Atari was one of the first uh, consumer-based game platform that came out. Um, and this was one of the uh, best-selling game on Atari platform called the Missile Command. If you just exclude the story from this game, what you are basically doing here is you have to avoid that red dot coming down and hitting you at the blue point. To avoid that happen, you have to use that blue dot and hit that red one to avoid. When I say this, this is not interesting, right? Because there's no story to it. It, it just describes what you have to do. But it gets engaging if there is a story. And miss a command here with this picture, then you would understand that you have to defend your cities from nuclear bombs. And you're the operator who shoots the intervention missile. Then it, it gets more engaging, right? You understand the object better and you're more motivated. And also, a second issue about the mastery. Mastery is not just about giving rewards or badges. You know, there is a goal, there's a feedback, and there's a reward. But it's not just earning rewards, because just earning rewards, is it engaging? And this is a very interesting example. Uh, on the left hand, do everyone know about the Skinner box? Um, okay, what uh, the mouse here is doing is that he knows when he touches on a lever, the sugar pellet comes out. And you know, mouse loves the sugar pellet. So he keeps on hitting it. So the sugar pellet is a reward. But let's, let's assume that there's a goal and there's an instant feedback and you get a reward for that is the game mechanics. There's a good uh, experiment 
uh, called Progress Wars. And it was uh, a game done by Jacob Skirting. And it, it, you, you just have to tap on the red bar and keep on tapping, and the bar just extends. And that's the reward. So the goal is to make that a bar full. And what you have to do is press on that red uh, button, and the reward is a full bar. But this is not engaging, right, at all. So what makes it very engaging is this. So why is it that video games are very rewarding? Yes, we do use these mechanics, but this right example is a good example that this isn't about fun. <laughs> so we need to define in video games, what is fun? So fun is just another word for learning. Fun from games arises out of mastery. It arises out of comprehension. It is the act of solving puzzles that makes games fun. With games, learning is the drug. Here, there's no learning. And after, let's say, there might be one learning, but after you learn that, what's next? It's a tedious, repeated action over and over and over, and you know what to expect. There's no learning. So this is what we need to have in mind when we design games. And when we use game mechanics, we want to motivate our uh, intervention audiences. Again, mastery, there's a tension. Will I make it? And if there's a big gap between the tension and the final resolution, that's when people get hooked. But one thing that we have to keep in mind here again is that how about this? Remember? We need to learn from something. How about this? School challenges us with mathematical equations. And all of you are challenged every day, I think. But sometimes, I won't say not all, but it's not fun, right? Mm -hmm. Then same kind of equation we may use for Magic the Gathering. It's a card game, but you have to calculate to win. But this calculation, it's the same calculation, but not tiresome. It's interesting. Why is that? It's part of learning, right? Both. But maybe we feel more fun from Magic Gathering. Because I want to just add another important aspect to this term of fun. Under optimal conditions. Fun is just another word for learning under optimal conditions. I know you are students of Kyoto University. Many of you might think equation is fun. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. I'm getting the right responses. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay? So, because it's not under optimal condition. Okay? When you're playing and when you're having fun, that is a proof that it's under an optimal condition to you. So how do we design an optimal condition? This is a very important part.
So, under optimal conditions, first, we need to have a challenge and it needs to be interesting. Let's say this is a golf, right? There's a goal and there's a rule. And the goal is just to put this little ball into this hole. And it's not interesting. Remember the Skinner box? The goal is, uh, uh, let's say, um, not Skinner box, this is better, progress wars. The goal is to have the bar full. The challenge, you need to press it. So, you need to have a rule to make things more engaging. In golf, the goal is to put this little ball into the little hole, but if you put a rule saying you have to use a golf club and you must start from a certain point, and you have to start from wherever the ball ends up. So this creates interesting challenges. And these challenges need to be interesting with clear visually presented goals, well-structured flow of goals, scaffolded challenges makes games interesting. And when I say scaffolded challenges, the tension between, uh, I won't say tension, balance between the difficulty and the time and skill needed to gain that or clear that difficulty has to be optimal. So this is uh, a graph that illustrates that, is that under optimal gain flow, it's not too easy, but also, it's not too hard to you. So when you start playing the game, the difficulty goes up, but the time needed to clear that difficulty is also balanced out. So you don't get bored or you don't get, or you, you, you just throw it away, right? No, I, I, I'm, never go, I'm never gonna clear this game. So it has to be very optimal. And also, under optimal conditions, varied pacing provided, uh, sorry, varied pacing provides failures to learn from and valuing the sense of accomplishment when you finally achieve it. So success feels more and more rewarding compared to the number of failures attempts. So you want to make things not too easy, but not too hard, but also at the same time, Pacing needs to be more uh, varied, not just in quantity, but in variety. When I say variety, uh, quality, depth, and complexity, these are the things that makes pacing more um, uni not unified. If the pace is unified, people start to get boarding, bored. But sometimes the challenges is a little uh, challenging than the normal pacing, then it gives a rhythm to the whole process. And also, uh, excessive positive feedback is very important in giving an optimal conditions. More the difficulty, more the excessive positive feedback is needed because you need to refuel his motivation to challenge the next stage. So these are the things that uh, you have to keep in mind when you design your game and intervention package to be very effective. I think I mentioned about the ghost of Mario Kart. So I, I put, added another slide. So Mario Kart 
has a ghost function in a time trial mode. Let's say you are a beginner using this Mario Kart game. Eventually, you get to play with your friends. But in the early stages, you would probably want to practice. So what Mario Kart did was you see a ghost. That is the fastest lap you have earned in this game. So you can compete with your best lap and learn from doing. This is one way of approach of giving an optimal condition. Because it's you who have done the best lap, meaning that you can easily, I won't say easily, but it's easier to overachieve what you have done. And by giving a ghost, you'll see where you made a mistake, where you did good. So it gives a good feedback. Not just a feedback, but good feedback. But also there are some areas that you have to be careful about when designing this intervention package. And this is a good example. Nintendo has developed a pedometer called a personal trainer walking. So if you have this pedometer with you every day, it captures how much you walked. And you can compete with people who have bought this uh, game and is playing. So every day, in the end of the day, you can hook up your pedometer to a game and say, so did I do good compared to other people who are using this game? And that's initially put into this game to motivate you because you want to compare and you want to compete. And also you feel the sense that you're not alone. There are other people who are doing the same thing. But that's a good mechanics, right? Game mechanics there. But someone in the next day, in a Twitter <laughs> or wherever, <laughs> releases this picture, right? Then you understand, wait a minute. Was I competing with a dog or like, you know, it demotivates you, right? So when you design a game, you want to kind of avoid people who can hack it or cheat on that. And another good example, you know Pokemon Go, right? What if <laughs> you see these people, <laughs> right? These are people on a segue, right? <laughs> Saying, yeah, that's not fair, right? That's not fair. You know, good mechanics are, the, uh, oh, and by the way, the right hand picture is Pokemon Go on a drone. <laughs> so you're not walking, you know, you know drones just going around and around. <laughs> yeah, so there's a game mechanic there under an optimal condition, but you have to have a system, or it's better to have a system where people can't cheat or hack. And this is, this is very important. So what we do, this is a picture of uh, a place that we, we, did a, uh, we did a pilot testing. What we do is to, to design a game and see whether it's designed in an optimal condition, we do a lot of pilot testing and monitor testing. And this is a picture of our title. When we prepared our software to be released 
in Europe. It was originally um, developed for Japanese uh, environment, but uh, same content, but different audience. You need to localize, culturalize, optimal conditions might have a uh, high dependency to culturalization and localization. So these are the things that we do carefully. And uh, that's a mirror there. So people who are doing a monitoring uh, test cannot see us seeing them. And also we set up a camera to see where actually the audience is hitting or pressing the button. And uh, with these reports, we change and configure the difficulty sometimes, and even sometimes uh, the level, and make it more optimized. Optimized means it gives a more hook, stronger hook to the audience. Another uh, important element. Uh, autonomy. This is very important. And this is a famous story from Tom Sawyer. Um, Tom Sawyer, uh, in his story, he's, he's asked to paint the wall white. And it, it's something that he didn't want to do, right? So what he did was he pretended that painting a white wall is very fun. Why? Because he knew his friends going to walk by and say, what are you doing? Right? If he was painting the wall very sadly, probably friends will say, hey, what happened? Your parents said you had to do this. But he wanted to persuade his friends to take over his job willingly take over his job. So he started painting it white and said, hey, this is so fun, right? So eventually his friends come over and say, what are you doing? This is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having fun. This is, this is great. And friends say, really? I want to do that. He said, no, 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 you can't do that. I want to do this myself. This is fun. And eventually, Friends were so persuaded that they started saying, I will pay you to replace you. <laughs> so not only he gained a money, but he was able to replace uh, his friend to do his job in the end. And what this describes is that in autonomy, it has to be a willingness there. You're willing to do things. And uh, so work means consists of whatever a body is obliged to do. But under optimal condition, it has to be a play where you are willing to do that. So again, if you... Uh, want to design a game and have people willingly play it, these are the things that you need to be um, careful. Autonomy can be easily damaged if you slipped extrinsic reward on an activity. When you say you are willing to do something, it needs to be intrinsic. But if you over, over put in an extrinsic reward, it demotivates you. So in the end, it curves the autonomy through control and devaluing the activity itself. So you, you would want to put in a reward after a certain task, but you don't want to have that reward as an extrinsic reward you want to disguise it as an intrinsic reward. How do you disguise it? It might differ on your audience, but the more the reward is intrinsic, the more user is motivated, and the more user 
or the high, higher the probability of user clearing the whole process. So this is a very important part related to autonomy. And so a little tip on how to avoid this uh, damage is one, try not to put strings attached as an extrinsic reward. Or even if you have an extrinsic reward strings attached, but you want to disguise it very carefully so that people do not think it's an extrinsic reward. And also, uh, shared goals and individual pursuit is another uh, a great way to, uh, to avoid this damage because there are friends there. You want to quit, but there's friends there. But also, you don't want this to happen, right? You don't want to understand that or know or realize that your friend was a dog, right? So this is where cheating, avoiding cheating comes in. And also, informational and helpful feedback rather than controlling feedbacks. When you do challenge, and there's a goal, and there's a rule, and there's an instant feedback, you don't want to say, hey, you didn't make it because you didn't do this and this and this, right? Play comes from solving puzzles. So you don't want to give them a direct feedback. You want to guide your audience to better understand what the, what the next move is. Great example. It's not saying you did not turn left in a 60 degrees diagonal here. That's why you didn't make the best rap. <laughs> You're learning from doing and learning from your past. This is a helpful feedback where there is still a room for an audience to solve the puzzle in a higher probability. And also, when rewards become expected, this is also boring. Remember the Skinner box? I don't know about the mouse. I'm not the mouse, but uh, if he, maybe he might understand just pressing sugar pellets every time. It might bore him. But sometimes you get a chocolate or whatever the difference, <laughs> then you're motivated to play more, right? Because you understand hey, there's an excitement, what's coming next, right? So, it's, so anyhow, uh, I don't know whether it's true for a mouse, but it's true for a human. So, unexpected rewards. 